All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Melissa Rondeau and Greg McClellan of Suzor Wines. We're at the Suzor Speakeasy here in McMinnville. It's March 9th, 2020. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Uh, first question for you both, uh, why wine? Well, I think that's a, a pretty big question. <laughs> and I'll start with my story. For me, you know, I grew up in California in the 80s. My mother worked for a wine distributor. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was also born in France, and so her family was still in France. So as a kid, spending summers in France, whether I liked it or not, it took me years to actually learn to enjoy it, but we would always visit clients. So every summer we were going to different wineries, different regions. Uh, my grandparents lived in the Loire Valley, so we were going to Chinon, we were going to mont -Louis, we were going to Vouvray initially, and then bit by bit, you know, we would go further and further to the Rhone region, all over the place. And as I said in the beginning, I would have rather been anywhere but there. But I remember like the, the moment that struck me that this was actually pretty great was I was 12 years old. We were in the Muscadet region. We were having a you know, simple picnic with probably a really cheap bottle of Muscadet and oysters. And I had that moment where I went, oh. I mean, I was lucky enough I got to be drinking wine at 12. And I said, oh, this is an amazing wine. And so some silly little 12 year old saying, this is my favorite wine. <laughs> I mean, you know, it still is one of my favorite wines, Muscadet, those are amazing wines, but I think that was kind of that first turning point um, that got me interested in wine. I went off to college and studied economics, which, you know, had nothing to do with wine, truly. Um, and it wasn't until right after graduating college that my sister, Scylla, <coughs> she said, what are you going to do? I don't know, I have a degree, I should probably do something. And my father was in, uh, he was a financial advisor and he bought me a very nice suit under the assumption that I was going to go and work in business. And I don't think I ever wore that suit because my sister said, why don't you get a job in the wine business? Go, go learn how to make wine. And so I got my first job at Ponzi and I was, you know, the intern that just never left. You know, never got hired on full time, just never left, kept on showing up every day. Um, I got to do everything. I spoke just enough Spanish to fake getting to work in the vineyard. I had just enough, you know, young, dumb confidence to say, I can drive that truck, I can do this, I can do that. And I think fortunate because of that kind of uh, you know, idiotic courage to uh, be willing to do anything, I was able to experience everything. So my first foray into the wine business as an intern, that was right there. That was when I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. So that for me was you know, short and long. It took about 10 years from first getting that glass of Muscadet till when I realized at about 22 that this is what I want to do forever. How about you? I like, I didn't think about this enough, but I think finally, um, enough, it starts in a similar place. I grew up in Montreal, so very much of a French influence in our culture, where at you know five, six, seven, you have a tiny, tiny glass of wine, and as you grow up, it kind of like you get a sip more and you get to try. You know, it's very much about, we're also eating oysters and snails and wine, and it's normal, it's not weird. Um, so I grew up with it in a similar way of the French influence and culture. Um, and then I started to travel, and then it took me in beautiful and amazing places. And I knew that I wanted to work in tourism and hospitality. And then the next, I think, natural world that came to me was food and wine, because that's what I gravitated towards. I have a brother-in-law that is an extreme um, enophil, vinophil, uh, passionate for wine, and so I grew up tasting all these amazing wines, and he is a Chevalier de Testevin, so he always hosts these very kind of like luxurious, you know, tastings with amazing wines, and from a very young age, I was back then just starting to study wine and food and hospitality, and he said, okay, well, if you help me host those tastings, so you pour the wines and you kind of like make sure everyone's okay, um, you get to have a seat at the table. 
And so I would sit with these, you know, I should be careful what I say, and these gentlemen <laughs> that loved wine and got to work on, you know, just discovering the world of wine and the beauty and really fine tuning my palate in a way that I was extremely, extremely lucky to be able to do. And from there, I, um, as a student, worked in real estate, um, which for an amazing leader that to this day I think is still a mentor to me, but realized that it was not my passion and I needed to be a very passionate person, needed to be in the world of what drove everything that I thought and cared about, which was food and wine. And so um, I did finish my degree, hospitality, tourism, food, wine, but went back to school to learn more about wine. And from there I decided, well, I know all these things. I've did all my, you know, WCT level three, this, this, that, that. I have all this information in my head, but I need to get my hands dirty, which was the next step. Um, I didn't want to just be on the restaurant side of things. So moved to France in the Loire Valley. Our path kind of crossed in many ways before we met each other. And I uh, did an internship in the vineyard for a summer and kind of realized, oh, okay, <laughs> this is what winemaking is about. And all, you know, this it's something to see, I think, the restaurant world and to see the psalm world and to see all this like hospitality and service. It was so amazing to see the flip side. And I'm so grateful that I took that time to go and see, you know, what it's like to pick fruit for 10 weeks, mm -hmm. six days a week for 10 hours a day, but also to have those meals with all the French people. Actually, I say all the French people. It was mostly Eastern European, the crew um, back then, but it was just like that French culture of like, we're eating baguette and wine on a table every day at lunch. Um, it was amazing. And then from there, went for a weekend in Paris and, um, <clears throat> applied for jobs in restaurant, which I don't know why, but anyways, things happened. And um, I went to this really small restaurant called Frenchie in Paris um, because a friend of a friend knew the gal that worked there. And um, I interviewed with this woman, she said, you have no experience in fine dining. Like, I can't, you, you will not survive. You will crash and burn. And as I walked out, the chef said, in French, j'aime sa patate, and I'm like, it means I like her potato, which is kind of like super weird. Uh, but Sounds insulting. <laughs> finally learned that he meant like he liked how it was like smiley and warm, and you know, being in Paris and restaurants, I think it was a bit refreshing to have that conviviality. And so he's like, come back tonight, and I came back, and I started working at Frenchie. I cried most evenings in the alley. Um, I got thrown forks behind the head repeatedly but I've learned like I've never learned in my life I was um, taken under the director of restaurant and taking to all these tastings and we would go visit wine regions and champagne and sit with those small producers that you cannot go into their homes unless you're you know it, you have those relationships those connections with a restaurant and fell in love with wine and at this point I knew I was in it for the long run mm -hmm. so um, I got a call out of the blue, my brother-in-law, the wine guy, um, one morning in I think October and he said, well, I invested in this winery in Oregon and I think you should go move there and run the program. And I said, well, I've never been to Oregon. <laughs> I just sold everything I owned to you know, live in France and make a life here. He's like, think about it. And then I did something crazy, left everything behind, I moved to Oregon to open Domain Roy. So this is my introduction to the world of wine. And the wine of Oregon. And the wine of Oregon. So there you go. Yeah. I'm curious with you, Greg, how did you end up, how were you here? Uh, you grew up in California, did you go to school here? Yeah, I, I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, I ended up going to college in Portland at Reed College. And there's no wine program there um, whatsoever. But in, yeah, as we all, kind of when we go through college there's many ways that your college defines who you become and it, it did but with wine it was entirely my family you know, it had nothing to do mm -hmm. with the college the college was you know allowed me to live in Oregon and I remember when I started applying for jobs internet was in existence but not massive and so I got 
one of those great maps. Here was Portland. Okay, I looked for every single winery. And I think I ended up applying to almost every single winery at the time. You know, there was probably 200 writing letters, buying a phone card to actually call each winery. Um, it was a laborious process, but fortunately for me, I got a job at the winery that was almost closest to Portland, which was Ponzi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, now my whole family also lives in Oregon. My, my French grandmother now lives in McMinnville. Uh, my mother, also from France and California, she's got a vineyard in Yamhill Carlton, lives in Portland, and uh, my other two siblings also live here. Awesome. Lucky. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. It's so what point did, did you two meet? I'm I'll always ashamed to say this story. It's kind um, of dorky. It's super dorky. <laughs> it was not too long ago. A handful of years. Yeah, 2016. Um, 16. Yeah. Um, at the, wait for it, Oregon Chardonnay Celebration. Good. Could Good. not be more corny if I tried. Um, but... <laughs> I want to like invent a story. No, but we were there both um, tasting at the Allison, and I came in. I had a few friends that were there, but that day. But I am very serious when I go into these events. So I came in, and I was like not hanging out with anyone. I go and I just go like, I just hit every single table. I'm there to taste. I'm there to learn. I'm not there to like uh -huh, socialize, whatnot. But two different people on that day said, "Do you guys know each other? You should meet." And so we were introduced two times in that day, yeah. and that kind of. By, by two very good friends also in the wine business, Rene Santamore of Hundred Sons and Dominique Mahe, who was at Willa Kenzie for years and is now uh, the winemaker at Willa Kenzie. Furioso. Oh, excuse me, Furioso, thank you. And who also ended up marrying us. <laughs> so, you know, there were, there were 17 people at our wedding, and he was the one person that was not family from either one of our sides. But the important thing was we needed to get someone who also spoke French and English. And so mm -hmm. it was great that one of the two people that introduced us could actually you know, fit that description. <laughs> it was perfect. Mm -hmm. So tell me about, uh, backing up just a little bit, I, just, I was just really curious at what point you had met and gotten together. So uh, you're, you're, you're both have, you've gotten a bug. You're, you're, you, you're at Ponzi, you're learning everything, you're, you're, you're starting up here in Oregon. Uh, tell me about the, the process of learning about Oregon, learning about Oregon wine, and of, and of finding your way of what you wanted to eventually do. I'm going to start with this one because it's easy for me. Um, coming to Open Domain Roy, which is second generation project from Beaufort, one of the things that naturally I, you know, was around was Jared and helping him on the weekends. He was doing his coattails wine. Back then he was doing it at Beaufort. So I was kind of just like helping him there do all this stuff and Michael would be like oh come and walk the vineyard with me and it was very like I have this very specific moment in my head where I was walking the before every year with Michael and he like digs and he takes soil in his hands and he like smell the soil and I was like cool sure it's my club so I'm gonna do whatever you say and I smell this one he's like but smell how it's alive and how you know specific it is and since then whenever I I've walked a vineyard, I kind of always dig my head in this. Well, you know, sometimes it feels completely dead. It feels lifeless. And that was really my introduction to Oregon wine. It was that, you know, this is the beauty of Oregon. This is the beauty of being able to walk the vineyard with a winemaker that's been here for, you know, 25, 30 years and doing what he does best. And um, really just that for me, like, grungy, raw, thoughts that I associated Oregon wine with really came to life in that moment. And ever since then, I've been, you know, really gravitating towards that world of winemaking, which is, a, you know, the Doug Tunnel house and, you know, all these, these experienced winemakers and today, you know, the newer waves and the newer generations that are doing really cool stuff. Um, the other thing I feel for me that's been really interesting is obviously tasting a lot of wine, but seeing how the community is welcoming and inviting and promoting of each other. Um, I feel like I was, first place that I tasted was Grand Moraine and Jason that worked in a tasting room back then. I called him after, I was like, hey, really loved hearing what you had to say. Can I take you out for coffee? I'd love to like pick your brain about 
hospitality program and what, he's, what I can do. And he said, sure, <clears throat> let's do it, that's me, but I have this weird feeling you'll get along with my partner really well. So he put me in touch with Sarah, who uh, I've been worked at Lemelson, and um, she invited me, and kind of like, we've had this beautiful discussion about the industry. Now she works at Stephen Smith, tea maker, kind of mm -hmm. took a little throw in that direction. Um, but you know, they took me into their wine tasting group, and in their wine tasting room with Jess Wiley from the Oregon Wine Board, and a bunch of other amazing people. And so it was this quick, I feel like, very real feeling of being part of the Oregon wine industry, which was amazing. What about you? What was the question? Uh, yeah, like or learning about Oregon wine. Talking about from when you from when you got in when you got to Ponzi. Mm -hmm. You're you're 22. You're you're at the bottom of the line at, at Ponzi. Tell me about the kind of the path into like learning the industry and, and learning about Oregon and learning sort of what you wanted to eventually do in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I was. I know I was incredibly lucky um, landing where I did at Ponzi because I was working for a second generation you know, Oregon winemaker. But while I was there, you know, Louisa was right there next to me. So I had full access to her. And I asked a million dumb questions. You know, someone who thought he knew a little bit about wine but really knew nothing. Like, oh, why don't you just do this? It's like, that's a horrible idea. But she entertained all of my horrible ideas. I mean, I assume it's because I was, you know, doing it somewhat in an entertaining fashion and making her laugh while doing it. But, you know, usually you work as an intern somewhere, you don't get to hang out with the winemaker and ask those stupid questions. Or if you do, you get to do it once. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get put on a different detail further and further away. Mm -hmm. But back then, Ponzi, there was four interns. Um, and I was just lucky enough to get along incredibly well with Louisa, she would take me to these tastings. I remember, you know, again, I was just an intern, but I would go to Adelsheim with her, and there was a round table of people, um, amazing winemakers, all kind of friends in a group, but I think most of them were sitting there going, why is, why is this kid here? And, you know, she very much just kind of kept me there and said, he's here to taste too. And so I got to learn from, you know, Dave Page was there, Eric Homaker was there, um, Bryce uh, from Witness Tree was there. There was an amazing group of people and you know they kind of warmed up to me and so all of those people became people that I had access to. Mm -hmm. But more than just that, again in that first year, Dick Ponzi was there and he wasn't there uh, in a kind of you know, emeritus winemaker position. He was there trying to figure out something every single day on how to make that vintage 2002 better. He was sitting there welding things, trying to make the tanks move smoother, looking at this destemmer that was a, easily a 25-year-old destemmer that I think they still have going today. But how to make it so that you know the berries stay you know more more whole, more consistently. It was amazing to be able to see someone who at that point, you know, she was well into his 30th vintage, I think, but not giving up, not saying, okay, time for me to you know, retire, go watch TV or go travel, but instead saying, all right, how can we make this better? How can we continue? And again, I was the dumb kid right next to him. like, what are you doing? He's like, well, let me show you. <laughs> he didn't have to. I'm <laughs> sure I was annoying, but it was access to people and their generosity to me that kept me going, kept me excited, and just opened up that world mm -hmm. of, okay, this is what's going on in the vineyard, this is what's going on down here, and it was the encouragement of those people that said, you know, if you really want to be in the Oregon wine industry, learn as much as you can, then go away, you know, because you're only going to be able to learn so much from the people you surround yourself with here, mm -hmm. you need to see what's going on elsewhere, and, you know, whether you bring that information back here to, to better yourself, you know, or, or if you stay there, because you fall in love with, with France, with Australia, with New Zealand, that's, that's up to you, but you know, don't limit yourself to where we are. So it was really just the luck of surrounding myself with people who are very, very generous. Mm -hmm. And now that I say that, remembering that I kind of need to continue that, and because you know, you've always got young people who are excited about it, and it's easy to say, get out of my way, I've got work to do. You can ask me those questions later, but it's really important to 
encourage that in people. So they encourage you to to go away in the nicest possible way. So, yeah, so tell I mean, me, not so, by fire. Or sure. So, so so tell me about that because I know you you left and came back. So tell me about your your sort of path back to where you are now. Well, so first I uh, I was with Ponzi for about two years, and then Lucy said, you know what? Like, why don't you go work for my husband, Eric Hamaker? And I interviewed with him, and he had just the the Carlton Winemaker Studio had just been going for not quite a full year, but had gone in for a full harvest. And so he hired me on initially just to, to be a grunt worker over there and with the you know, potential to work directly under him. And that first harvest there, you know, there was Dominio Four, Penarash, Andrew Rich, uh, Scott Paul was there at the time, uh, Ribbon Ridge, uh, Dewey Kelly. And it was just an amazing collection of people. Uh, the story was, you know, this is a place where we're basically we're all roommates. We share each other's ideas. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't. But fortunately, while I was there, it really was a collection of amazing minds. People that had made wine for a number of years, great wines. People have gone on to make even better wines. And there I was again, a young dumb kid that was kind of entertaining. Enough to the point where, you know, Lynn Penarash, Andrew Rich, and Eric Homaker, I still count as very close friends of mine. And they were kind enough to treat me not as just this young kid, but as a young kid who was, you know, smart enough to want to learn. And they took me under their wings. So eventually, enough of them encouraged me, you speak French, leave. You, you've got an education in economics that serves you to have a decent mind but go somewhere else and so I, I set up an internship in Australia, in New Zealand and in France and at the encouragement of Louisa and Josh Bergstrom I ended up going to a, a one year program in Bonn for winemaking and viticulture which was amazing. Uh, the school itself was fine, it was good um, but living in Bonn where you know, my backyard was Pomar, it was it was incredible just having access to that land, to see it on the weekends, to try to go wine tasting wherever I could. It was, it was pretty special. Mm. So, I got lucky. That's amazing. I also thought I spoke French when I got there, and it turns out I didn't really, <laughs> or not, not the level I'd taken French in high school, and that was it, and so I showed up and just kind of, you know, started to speak French and it didn't really come out very smoothly and I had a month uh, working at a winery before school started and so I had that month to really hone my French and learn it because right when I got into school it was you know wine science which is uh, you, you need to be on it so a good crash course helped me out he speaks perfect French <laughs> <laughs> So Mel, I'm curious, uh, with, with your with your sort of journey, uh, you, you say you kind of had an early affinity for for hospitality, for service, for food and wine, mm -hmm. uh, and then you kind of got thrown into the deep end in France uh, and, and struggled. So I'm curious about, uh, did you, did, did that deter you at all? Did you, all, did, you cons did you ever consider going somewhere else or was that kind of the path you were going to be on? I knew already, as hard as it was, both in, you know, the vineyard side of things um, for you know half a year and and whatnot, and then the hospitality side of things was was even harder in many ways. Um, but I knew it's where I was. Mm -hmm. I was staying in that field. I was staying in that world. I was um, energized by the stories and the people I met along the way. Um, I always remember one of the wines that I sold a lot when I worked on the floor at Frenchie was. Uh, Olivier Riviere Jequitiba, and he's in the Rioja region. And you know, I had you know, you just saying access to people. I had that calling card. Hi, it's Melissa from Frenchie. I'm, um, you know, I'm the maitre d'. I'm the assistant. Tom, um, can I come and taste? And you know, everything's so close and so easy. So being invited in those people, cellars and homes, and sharing your meal with them, and really hearing the deeper stories. Um, I fell in love with, with that, kind of like it became a drug to just like wanted to hear more of those stories and taste all the the wines that were in barrel. And back then, you know, no understanding of what I was tasting in barrel, really. Mm -hmm. It was hard for me to visualize mm -hmm. 
what that would become because I didn't have that experience. Um, but I still kind of soaked it all in and had these beautiful moments with amazing people. And I knew I was there to stay. Actually, funnily enough, I just re remembered while you were talking about Bone, I had my domain role interview in Dijon because I was going for the weekend to Les Espies de Bone and the owners, the Roy's, uh, father and son were happened to be there for that and so we met and I interviewed for the position for Dendy, Oregon in, in Burgundy. World. It's just, it's, yeah, it's a small world but it was crazy. I think the, the, the wonderful thing about you though is, you know, you have always had the kind of the training, the experience in hospitality and that's where the majority of your professional career has been but you've always accessed the other side. <coughs> it rarely happens the other day where other way where production says, you know, let me go work front of house for a little bit. Um, you know, it's usually a separation of places, but you've always said, you know, you went and you worked in the vineyard. You've, you know, at Roy, you said, I'm going to go pick fruit today. Um, and then as we grew together with Suzor, you know, I was, was kind of like, oh, this is wonderful. You know, separation. I'll do this, you do that. And you're like, no, 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 no. Like, this is, I want to be a part of this too. And I was, I remember thinking, that's kind of silly, like, you know, it's just a punch down. Who wants to do a punch down? But you've recognized uh, the value, the importance of you know, sharing access to everything. And it's, it makes, I think, us better, stronger you know, in winemaking, in just our relationship. And just seeing you want to tackle both sides, it's, it's very impressive. How do you feel about tackling hospitality? I hate it. <laughs> Yesterday, we uh, we had a very sick child for the past few days, and so we went to the beach this weekend to kind of just like make the family better. And we're at the beach, and I see this like little inlet, and it would fit perfectly like a table, long table, twenty chairs. And I'm like, we could do this crab dinner, and it would be so perfect, and we could do just like newspapers, and like I had this vision this moment. And he looks at me, and he's like. Oh, I hate when you talk about these things. <laughs> and I'm like, I love it. I could live, you know, just for that. Some of our really good friends own this beautiful, um, well, they found it and they, they run it, but like Secret Supper, mm -hmm. it's called, um, and where they do these, these gatherings, I would say, um, all across now the world, they became very popular. But every time that I have a chance to go and work the event, I'm like, can I just be there and pour wine, like, please, please, please. And yes, I want to see more of that. Um, but just coming back really quickly to saying, how about um, me, you know, wanting to touch production. One of the things that I have seen, and that's, I don't think this is just true to Oregon, um, but it's sometimes in the wine industry, I notice that um, sales, hospitality, winemaking, production are very siloed, mm -hmm. right? They kind of like don't speak to each other. It's like you're you're in the front of the house, you're in the back of the house, and often I don't see those worlds, I think, merging as much as they could. They do. There is an interest, but I'll always remember at Roy, I would take my lunch break and go downstairs on the pad, on the crush pad, because that's where all, uh, you know, our team, our pickers would, <coughs> would have lunch, and I would bring my, like, arugula, fig, and chef salad, and they had all these like, thermos that their wives were picking of these amazing Mexican dishes, and we would share, and it was really special, but I feel like it's not necessarily something that, you know, and we would talk about, you know, what's happening today, what's happening with picking the fruit, what, what is it looking like, and exchange stories about our families and their kids and their wives and all these things. I would love to see a world in Oregon where I think front of the house and back of the house have a little bit more of that community feeling, you know, working harvest and friends at lunch every day at that table. It was the owners of the winery, it was the front of the house staff. It was the pickers, it was the winemakers. It, everyone came together around the table and shared a meal. I see it in Oregon. I think we can do it more. So tell me about the role you were hired for at Domain Roy, and, and you, you mentioned like sort of starting this, starting this from scratch, basically. So what were you sort of hired to do? And, and tell me, take us through the process of sort of starting a brand like that from basically scratch. Um, I was hired to come and run the hospitality program. That was kind of 
the goal behind it. So when I moved here, um, we were working, you know, people say, oh, it's so fancy, you're so lucky. I was like, yeah, the first year and a half, we're in a construction trailer with a honey bucket. Like, <laughs> there was absolutely nothing fancy about that job for a good while. Um, so we were in that small trailer. It was Jared, a winemaker, Miguel Lopez, uh, which now runs Red Dirt with his sister. So doing all the vineyards, the winemaking stuff. And then we had Jessica, which was a controller. So a very small team of four. And, um, you know, I had to bid a hospitality program, but really there was no hospitality to be done for a little while. So it was, you know, um, oh, actually, I forgot about our superintendent from the construction project that was in a trailer, too. <clears throat> which, actually, we were probably all in his trailer, to say the <laughs> truth. Um, Roger, which whom I adore and loved. Um, so it was a lot of ordering bathroom fixtures. Mm, somewhat to do with hospitality, but not really looking at architectural plans, which was really fun. Um, with Stephen Lapp at Water Relief Architecture and saying, you know, does this make sense on plan from a hospitality perspective? I think Jared had such a good vision for one he wanted for like the winemaking and the overall vision. There was a lot of trips back to Sherwood Williams back and forth to paint different colors of the wood of the winery outside, inside. Um, so, you know, it was not all that glamorous, but at the end of the day, it was a lot of really building literally from the ground up, right? and helping with those decisions, but at the same time working on developing the website and looking at labels, the initial labels were. Less than attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty bad. Um, but you know, we were, we were starting, we were figuring things out as we went. Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was amazing to be able to taste every, you know, everything that was being made. We made it back then right next door. Mm -hmm. which was not for you, so it was crumble rock mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. then. And so it was fun to just walk over, face all the wine and see what was happening, but just ha have that closeness to everything in their project, which was, you know, from buying the furniture to helping with the wine to the very first harvest. You know, I was working my full days upstairs, and then I would change in my harvest clothes and go downstairs and do, I'd call it my night shift, and be the cellar rat and help our you know, harvest team and to be able to have that hands-on proximity with the project was, for me, an ideal. Uh, but it was also super challenging in a sense of there's a lot of pressure, there's, you know, investors that are wanting budgets and timelines and all these things. And so you're kind of like thrown in it and you just got to survive. A lot of it was, I think, keeping Jared on <laughs> task. He has a beautiful creative mind. So it was a lot of just kind of like wrangling his creative mind into budgets and timelines. Uh, but that made sense. That was, you know, those are my strengths. And so it, it balanced out. Mm -hmm. um, walking the sites that we purchased fruit from, discovering the Willamette Valley. I, you know, I've never been here before. So that was amazing to be able to, to do that and really understand, okay, what, you know, we were buying a lot of, it was Denny Hills and Yanhole Carlton, so starting to understand the difference between the mm -hmm. AVAs and the soils and how that impacted the wine. And so really learning also, it was a huge learning curve for me mm -hmm. from Oregon wine and fruit all the way to architecture plans and everything in between, truly. It's a lot, I don't know. I don't know that I answered that question Absolutely. fully, but um, it, was, it was amazing. It was really hard, but it was amazing. <laughs> Wouldn't change it. <clears throat> and tell me about you coming back to Oregon. At some point, at some point you, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to turn this over. That's <coughs> what I was talking about earlier. All right, so, so at some point you, are, you decided to come back to Oregon. So tell us about that mm -hmm. and, about, and where you landed when you came back. Yeah, uh, fortunately, you know, I started the job search while I was still in France, and Josh Bergstrom, who, you know, kind of advised me to to go to do this program in France. He was starting up a new project um, at the time called Trisadum. So he hired me to kind of be his, uh, you know, I worked for them for a number of years uh, initially under him, which was great. Um, and then a few years into that, I, I had the opportunity, you know, I'd saved up everything I'd ever had. And I had the opportunity in 2011 to make five barrels of Pinot. So that was the first vintage of Suzor and you know it's it's amazing you see all these wineries that are doing 5,000 cases 10,000 cases these beautiful buildings 
um, kind of like Domain Roy, and here I am like, oh my gosh, I just spent everything in you know that I have to make five barrels of Pinot Noir. <laughs> you know, I bottle it, and then I realize, oh, before I can even sell this, I now need to pay for another you know vintage. So 2012, I think I did six barrels of wine. So it was a very slow process. So while I was doing that, you know, I was still working at other wineries. Mm -hmm. I still am today because the reality is, uh, you know, it's, it's an expensive business to be in. It's an expensive business to you know, grow in. And uh, you know, a lot of bigger wineries that get into this business have gotten into it because of, you know, lucrative successes elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, you know, not everyone was like that, though. There's a number of generations of winemakers before us, you know, same age, and you know, even now you see more of people who are just, you know, I've got a few dollars and I really feel strongly about doing this. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing to see. I think it's, it's tough because you have to have another job to, to support yourself while you grow. You have to have a partner that is willing to dive in with you or support you in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Yeah, so it's been a slow growing process. Um, we've had a few people kind of, you know, ask, can we help out in certain ways, you know, financially? And for better or worse, I kind of think, you know, whether it's our stubbornness, but to have an outside person help means getting them to also have them have a voice and not wanting that. You know, it slows your own growth as mm -hmm. a brand, but it also keeps it in your control, mm -hmm. for better or worse. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think it's it's been better for us to keep everything in our control. Why the name Suzor? That is uh, my grandmother's maiden name. So the woman who uh, you know, allowed me to you know, go to France in the summertime to visit her. That kind of forced me to learn French. <coughs> um, and, you know, she, she and my grandfather paid for a little bit of my education while in Burgundy, which was <coughs> very, very helpful. And also, when I had long weekends, I'd go back and visit them. So they were always integral in my education. Um, my grandfather was a Dutchman, but he had a, this wine cellar that, you know, truly, it was a cave that went down underneath their property. And he did not have uh, great taste in great wines, but he loved wine. He would buy what's called vin en vrac. It's basically bulk wine, little cubitainers of it from, uh, from Beaujolais. And you know, this year I got you know, 25 liters of, or 200 liters of uh, you know, Morgon. So in the summertime, as a kid, we would bottle it. And it was always just having that wine, you know, like, it was daily wine, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but so I always attributed, you know, wine making to my grandparents, and so when searching for a name, you know, what is it going to be? Um, I'm not French, but my mother is, my grandmother is, and that link was always very important to me, so I wanted something that at least expressed that side of the family, and so I thought Suzor would be the right mm -hmm. choice. Of course, when I told my grandmother that I decided to name the wine after her, I was waiting for her to say, like, "Oh, Gregory, I'm so happy!" Like, you know, just like what an honor. And instead, she kind of casually was like, "That's okay." <laughs> like she didn't really care, <laughs> or it just wasn't that impressive. I love that French, like, yeah, like yeah. blase. Nah. Okay. As soon as you left, she was on the phone to all her friends telling them about it, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> well, the first few years, I would drop off a few bottles of wine whenever I saw her, and then I realized that they were being stockpiled up. I was like, okay, she either doesn't like my wine, which sucks, or she's not drinking anymore, but I know she drinks because when we all have dinners together, she'll still drink. So one day she called me over, and I was using screw caps back then, and she said, could you please open up all the screw caps and like put them back? She couldn't crack open the bottles because she wasn't strong enough. <laughs> so at least it wasn't that she didn't like my wines. She just wasn't strong enough to open them up. <laughs> so 
So tell me about the, the early years of Suzor before the two of you met. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about all of the details you have to do to start a label, all of this, the finding your grapes, finding your materials, finding a place to make it, finding a way to sell it. All, all, how did you deal with all that yeah. as a side job, I guess? Yeah, and I you know, had only been in production, and which I think is why I hit on that with Melissa. It's always better for people to kind of experience all the sides of the wine business, because winemaking is a very small part of it, mm -hmm. to be honest, especially when it's your own business. Um, and so it was a very quick, and I'm still learning though, uh, learning curve of things like, oh, the really unsexy stuff of you know, TTB, Secretary of State in Oregon, you know, starting your own business, how do you license that? Insurance, all of that stuff that, you know, you go home at night, you go on your computer, you figure out how to do it, and uh, it is, yeah, when you're first starting your business, you get super excited, and I see a lot of people doing this, like, I just bought half a ton of, of grapes, I'm super excited, and my first question is, are you doing this legally? You know, are you, are you paying? Do you have insurance? Do you have, like, have you got your domain for your website? And it's like, oh, we all get super excited about making wine, and that is really just a small part of it. So I, I learned that uh, very, very quickly. But as far as sourcing fruit, I was lucky. My mother had a vineyard. Um, at that point, I had been in production about five years, and I knew uh, a number of the people that had purchased fruit from her over the years. So I was able to taste the wines from that vineyard. And I really did like it. It was still young, young fruit. So it really hadn't grown into its own, but it was very pretty. Uh, my mother did say, well, do you want to partner up? And I said very stubbornly, no, I want to stand on my own. So I, you know, it was transactional uh, at best, the relationship. But which was good, I think, just to kind of keep uh, the professionalism uh, in family. <clears throat> Um, for barrels, my brother-in-law, who was, uh, he's a kind of wine enologist, he actually runs a wine testing lab here, and he imports barrels from Burgundy. And I remember thinking, you know, how great would it be to use the barrels that he's bringing in? And so I've been using Mercury barrels from day one because they work wonderfully with the wines that I'm making. Um, when it came to label design, uh, we, I worked with this uh, woman from Nectar Graphics, Andrea LaRue, mm -hmm. who's local here. But I also called up my sister, who's great with design, and said, I need you to look at these. You know, I know what I'm good at, but more importantly, I know what I'm not good at, and it's design. I'm, I'm horrible at it. And she was able to kind of you know, have the artist's eye and say, this looks great, keep this, don't keep that. And so surrounding myself with good people mm -hmm. was the first trick. I remember when it came to, you know, where am I going to make these wines? I was having these conversations with people because we do have a great community of, of friends, family, just everyone around me, around you, been really supportive. And I was talking to Louisa, and, and she's just going to make your wine here. It, I wasn't asking her. I wasn't making any assumptions. And she was just like, why would you not make your wine here? It just makes sense. And it was super nice at the time. Nobody else was making wine there, so that, uh, that year she was making, you know, probably 50,000 cases, and I was making 200 <laughs> cases. <laughs> so it was really, really amazing to uh, have that ability. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, a lot of, you know, they had I think, like 22 interns that year, and they all looked at me as, you know, that guy that just shows up and does punch downs every once in a while. Like, who the hell is he? <laughs> but she was so open, you know, again, it was that, that generosity mm -hmm. of the people that you meet mm -hmm. along the way that doesn't ever go away. But yeah, the, the starting of the business is, it's a challenge and it, it continues to grow because, yeah, as, as a producer, I, I know how to make wine. Um, you know, you can decide whether it's amazing or horrible, but then you're kind of left with, Okay, I made it. Oh, I have to support myself. I've got to go sell that. And I worked a, a little bit uh, in the restaurant industry here in Oregon, so I knew a few people, and that was my way to kind of start. But then you go, how do I talk to distributors? How do I do this? How do I do that? And I, 
I still fumble at it. Absolutely. I'm lucky enough that I have someone that is way well, way better first than I am in that situation. But you know, if you get into this business, whether you want to or not, you have to learn every aspect of it and recognize your, your own weaknesses and strengths and work on your weaknesses or be lucky enough to have a partner who uh, can complement you in, in a variety of different ways. But we still, you know, now it's 2011 was the first, was the first vintage. And so 2020, you know, it's almost 10 years in. Mm -hmm. um, and we're still constantly working so hard at, you know, we just changed a lot of the sourcing of the fruit this mm -hmm. year. We made a bold choice to say we had this site in Yamel that we love. The fruit was, you know, really beautiful and really complimentary to Menifee's mother's vineyard. But we were really, or I should say, I was really pushing for organic fruit mm -hmm. as being, you know, the fruit was clean. It was you know, no synthetic herbicides or pesticides, or, you know, I was lab certified, all these things, but I was like, let's, you know, we were writing a check to a vineyard site that we don't have a relationship with, <coughs> that we don't know the people who farm it, that we don't know what goes really onto it, and that's been super important to me of saying, you know, let's go talk to other people, and, you know, we approached, we can't disclose it for now, but a friend that works at a vineyard in Yula and said, you know, we know they've been farming biodynamically, organic. Um, we know the people. We, we can walk the vineyard with them. We can have these conversations about, you know, um, everything from what goes on all year round and get, you know, just that connection to the place. That's super important. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, last year we're making pretty strong, I think, change decisions into the fruit itself, mm -hmm. but also into the self out of thing where we um, have partnered with a uh, consultant that does national sales that handles that for us because you know it's a, an economy that's consolidating over the last few years and it's harder and harder for it was hard for me to get Domain Roy in the books and in portfolios having the second generation connection to Beaufort and having that behind us it was still hard mm -hmm. with time we got there because I think the, the wines spoke for themselves but having a brand that's ours that makes a small production that you know we don't have any kind of like sexy story behind it and it's in a certain way it's like how do you get through the door how do you make those calls like can you taste my wine like, who are you you know we've never heard about Suzor wines and so partnering with Garrick um, who used to work at Evening Land still represents their wines but started his own consulting company called Hallow um, has been helping us so much kind of like getting those connections going and those relationships being built for us, which has been amazing. So once again, it's keeping that, I think, understanding of surrounding ourselves with people that know what they're doing, that they're good at what they're doing. But most importantly, when it's your business, people that you love, people that share the same values, that family, you know, Garrick is someone that we, I think, you know, adore who he is and what he stands for. And so that's the beauty of having your own business. Mm -hmm. It's having those relationships with vineyards and vineyards manager that we trust, we love, we share so much. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, working with, oh, yeah. We, we had the ability, and this one vineyard that we worked with was amazing fruit, but I was still writing a check to a P.O. box at the end of the day, and you think, geez, you know, it's, is the grapefruit everything? No, there's, we have amazing fruit all over the place. So let's instead find another great vineyard, but where we have a relationship with the people behind the vineyard where I can drop off the check you know, to the, the growers. Um, that, and I think that was you that kind of really said, let's, let's, kind of, you know, let's not make the assumption that what we're doing right now, everything is perfect. Let's you know, re-examine as we, as we grow and kind of reveal, re-reveal what we're doing to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, we, if we are making the right choice, great. If not, it will probably strengthen us. And I think it did just that, recognizing that, hey, it's actually a little bit more fun working with a vineyard that we like the people there, we know the people there, mm -hmm. you know? So it's that strength that, that the Oregon community, we're able to have it because it's still a small community. You know so many people, um, you have access to them that uh, has allowed us to be able to kind of grow 
slowly but in more and more positive directions each year. In the past few years, we've also, um, when I met Greg, he was making, you know, Pinot and Chardonnay. And, you know, he's a very classic person in everything he does. And in some hard ways, he married me. We're like, ah, let's do Gamay, let's do Rosé, let's do all these things, let's do a pet night. And he's like, whoa, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> um, but we've added to our portfolio now a Rosé of Pinot from Menifee that is kind of just <clears throat> always a little bit. Broad instead of linear. It's it's a it's a non-classic Willamette Valley rosé, and it's it's super fun to have that. At first, I was you know disappointed. I was like, oh, I just wanted to make a classic Oregon rosé, and then you kind of realize like, wait, we talk about the importance of the vineyard making the wine. Well, this vineyard makes this wine. Mm -hmm. So, getting to learning to embrace the thing that we uh, want to cherish. Mm -hmm. uh, this really is a beast. It's always has like a really rich mouthfeel and you know almost like has umami mm -hmm. flavors. It's just it's so unique. And at first we were just like looking at each other like uh oh and <coughs> what have we done? But we learned to love it and to appreciate it for what it was. And so we're still learning and we're still growing mm -hmm. and it's fun when we see accounts that, you know, in Portland also love that one and they want to play with it and want to pair it. Tusk had it by the glass this mm -hmm. summer and it's fantastic. It's like, okay, we're doing something right, you know. We have that encouragement from the community mm -hmm. that it is a product that they can see even though if it's not classic. And that's another thing, you know, I think Oregon wines are beautiful and I love Pinot and Chardonnay more than anything else, but it's also, what else can we do? And we started doing Gamay in 2018 for the first vintage and it's been so exciting to work with that fruit um he you know makes someone in, at meth and family and they have beautiful plantings of gamay and he was selling this fruit to you know division wines and a handful of really good producers and i was like why don't we make some more <laughs> <Make some for us. laughs> and it was such a natural fit it was you know you were so comfortable and you knew the fruit you know that obviously you know the site inside and out and um making that gamay we also started pushing a bit of boundaries i asked if we could do unfine and unfiltered for that one which we've done and we're learning then again how to make it classic yet i think true and transparent mm -hmm. um, we uh, treated it like Pinot it was all neutral oak you know there was no whole cluster or anything like that um, but do you love that gamay that we've made sometimes <laughs> but I think it's it's more of uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's the winemaker's dancer I've ever heard <laughs> but I mean you know I mm -hmm. stubbornly I, I started Cesar on my own and it's very easy to make a decision it's whatever you know, it's a vote of one, and with Melissa being a huge part of Suzor, it's no longer a vote of one. It's no longer well, it's my business. So whatever I say goes. Mm -hmm. It's what's well, our business. Shoot, one vote over here, one vote over here. We're both tied. So trying to navigate and figure out what's best for us as a business, what's best for us, you know, as partners with each other, and. You know, it's rarely easy when it's nice and easy. It's great. Like, wow, we just made that decision. It was perfect. But it took me less with the Gamay, but we also make a, uh, a Petillance Naturelle, a sparkling wine. And then I remember when Melissa first suggested we do that, thinking it was you know, over my dead body. <laughs> it feels, uh, you know, like I know there's a long, wonderful, beautiful tradition in France uh, in making Petillance Naturelle, but it's a super hipster wine and I hate everything it stands for and most of them are horrible and I went off and I said absolutely not and then we bottled 50 cases of it and you know even after that first vintage I was still very opposed to it just like I don't I don't like this oh, we didn't even do 50 cases of that first vintage we did like 20 cases because um, that was where we said okay well we'll just do a small amount and uh, baby steps and we did 12 cases of the one that Melissa liked better and 12 cases of the one that I liked better because we, we couldn't agree head to head on, on which one, one was better. And that, I guess that was our way at, back then of saying, all right, we're agreeing to disagree. We'll just try both. 
and neither one was right or wrong. It was actually really fun to showcase. Right? This is the one that she prefers. This is the one that I prefer. And then the next year we said, all right, let's do a little bit more. So you know, that's when we did 50 cases. And this thing that I was adamantly opposed against, now I'm almost a little excited about. You know, like, I love the, this next vintage that we've done of it. And I'm thinking, all right, how do we expand this? Should we? And you know, I, I've completely done a 180 from my initial reaction. And it's because Melissa is, you know, willing, uh, adventurous, uh, wanting to explore, uh, despite my desires to kind of stay the, the true course of classic, what I think is classic, you know, Oregon, mm -hmm. Pinot and Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Well, it takes an outsider to come in and say, yeah, but Oregon is not, it just, it's not more, than, it, it can be more, it is more than that, mm -hmm. you know, and it absolutely is. So it's nice to have that uh, that person next to you saying, "Come on." It's and coming back yes. to France, where you know you grew up, and I spent a lot of time learning and working in the wine business. You know, there's this whole movement of vin France. What's happening over the past few years is small producers that can't afford to, you know, get the top tier fruit within their um, AOC. And so, working with fruit that is not regulated, and they're they're their region and mm -hmm. so making those wines that are just you know French wine that don't fall under you know their their region um, or their village but you just wine producers that are just trying to make really good wine mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be compartmentalized it's just I'm super inspired by that and so I but I love both I love kind of playing off of the classics they remain I think super important to our region and who we are as a brand and I think you know our flagship will always be the Pinot and the Chardonnay but it's so much fun to discover experiment uh, experiment we've convinced um, his mom to graft this last year um, an acre to Gamay and two acres to Chardonnay on our vineyard so I love to see a bit of diversification in the fruit mm -hmm. in the Willamette Valley um, and hopefully in the industry as a whole. We'll talk about that in a second. Don't worry. I'll come back. I'll come back to that. <laughs> this is this is a this is a new one for us, though. I don't know that we've had a brand like this quite before, where one one partner had started it and then the, the merging so so classically like this, and and, not, and someone coming in from the industry as well. So, in in what other ways has it changed since you since you became a couple? And I know we have the space we're in now. We can talk about, but I'm curious about that kind of merging of styles that you're talking about and what the brand looks like now, ten years in, mm -hmm. compared to what it looked like at the beginning. I mean, the easiest thing is, you know, I, I would show my wines maybe, you know, around Portland, but I wasn't doing events, I wasn't hosting people, um, you know, I didn't want to. Um, I never wanted to go and do that. I, I thought, okay, I'll just, you know, sell wines in these spots, mm -hmm. and that will be good. And when Melissa came on, she's kind of like, why aren't you pouring your wine more often? I was like, oh. There's no, no need for that. It's like, no, you know, you need to bring people here. You need to, you know, there was no hospitality uh, for Suzor. Yeah, it didn't exist. It wasn't in the budget. There was no budget for that. Um, but, you know, there was, we didn't even have the space to begin with, but Melissa always found ways like, okay, we're going to do a pop-up over here. We're going to pour our wine locally. It's like, oh, okay, I don't know how to do that. You know, we don't have glasses. Okay, we're going to go buy glasses. Okay, we don't have, uh, I've got a printer at work that I, no, we're going to go get up, you know, like, we're going to do all these steps, we're going to make it right, we're going to do it properly. And so it was having someone who had access to all sides of the wine industry saying, you're, you're lacking in this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some days I still think, I don't care, I don't want to do that. And it's like, well, great, you grow up, just because you don't want to do something, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. And, yeah, so we still fight. Sometimes I grumble about these things, but it's made everything, you know, that much better, I think. I'll remember, I think it was three years ago, just around three years ago, we went to a, um, a dinner with friends at one of, you know, 
Evan Martin, Martin Woods, mm -hmm. um, and Sarah's house, and um, it was a lot of, you know, Greg's really good friends in the industry, and I brought a bottle of scissor and I put it on a table, and I was like, what is that scissor? And I was like, <laughs> oh no, we have a problem. Like, your own group of people don't know about your wines. And that's just Greg. He's a very humble person. He's not one. You know, there's a lot of, I think, ego sometimes in the industry. He's not one. And that is about, you know, kind of shouting about his brand or what he does. Um, and But that started for me to think, okay, we need to have Cezor out in the world. People need to know about, you're making beautiful wines. Um, and only a handful of people, you know, know about what you're doing and get to taste, you know, also and stay with the brand and taste different vintages and see where we're going with the brand. Part of it was hospitality. So, okay, so we have no investor, uh, no cash flow, um, <laughs> but how can we do a hospitality program? And then this opportunity came around and it's, you know, it's very humble. It's very us. You come in here, we're in parking lot views. I, I think I disclosed it on the website. I said, no fancy bathrooms and parking lot views. You need to know what's happening. But this is what you're happening. You're also tasting with the owners, with the winemakers. We have their record playing. I always invite people. I say, I don't touch it. You go and put, you know, the record that talks to you. You know, it's that interaction, that relationship with our guests when we host here. It's very, it's very, I think, humble of an experience. I open a bottle, it's corked, instead of saying, <gasps> and running in the back, I'm like, are you comfortable with, you know, what a cork wine is? And let's taste it, and let's smell it, and let's, you know, it's, we're not hiding from anything. It's really, I think, transparent in, in who we are. Um, you know, everything in here was a reclaimed resource. Everything is Habitat for Humanity, Goodwill, we just make it our own. We almost got divorced with the ceiling that's above us that you can't see, but it's hanging drapes and we fought for numerous hours over an inch this way, no, two inches that way, no, it's not centered, because I'm a little crazy like that. Um, but we've, you know, spent a lot of weekends just making this space our own and feel like Suzor, feel like our home, feel very, I think, true to who we are. And, how we like to do hospitality, which is very, I think, authentic in like the gathering space. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want anything too, you know, stuck up. Nothing too formal. Too formal. And a lot of the things, is, well, you don't need a lot of money. We did this on a few hundred dollars, you know. Um, same with doing pop-ups in collaboration. The first year we did them at Local Flow here on Third Street. I called Heather and I was like, you know, you close at four. Can we come five to eight a few Fridays and just pop up in in your juice bar? And the answer was like, yes, we would love to. And we started like that mm -hmm. and kind of have, you know, that, that crowd that followed us and that thought it was fun, it was a little bit different. Same thing in Portland, it's calling, you know, I cold called it, we're now our friends at Secret Supper, but I was like, I see you're doing all these things. Can we trade wine for, you know, photography and, and exposure? And yes, and now we've built a beautiful friendship around it, but it's not, I think it's just, not being afraid to make those calls. And mm -hmm. we've done so many amazing suppers over the past year, you know, it was um, Subtle Lodge, we did a Tusk collaboration dinner, and then we did Serenade in Portland. Mm -hmm. And we just did last week or two weeks ago, a Westward Whiskey, one of Greg's really good friends, the founder and, and master distiller there. And now we're doing a collaboration where they're aging some of their whiskey in a Suzor barrel and we're going to release that in May and you know I feel like it's an industry where I see it a lot and I often look outside of the wine industry for inspiration because I feel the wine industry can be very rooted in traditions which is fantastic and great and you can learn so much from it but it also has a hard time I think looking forward pushing the boundaries and so I look a lot at beer and coffee industries for inspiration when I do kind of marketing and sales you know, the beer industry is so good at doing all these cool collabs and and they do these, um, you know, they'll work different breweries together and I'm like this special batch and it's, how can we do this? How can we bring that to the wine industry? Let's do, you know, look at people around us where we do a high tea tasting here. We have this jam that is made by um, our friends right here in town. They have this beautiful label called Alchemist Jam. Mm -hmm. And so they tasted the wines and we made they made a jam that is meant to be, you know, enjoyed, I won't say paired, but enjoyed with, uh, 
with our juice and that's amazing and then we went to Brianna in Portland her and her mom have iced tea and we're like let's make a blend that you know kind of aligns itself with what we're trying to do and at the end of a high tea we'll do something that is kind of recentering to you know the body, the digestive system, the soul. We've indulged in a lot of wine. How are we healthier and more holistic as an industry is another thing. You know, the wine industry, there's a lot of eating, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of crazy hours, whether you're in hospitality or you're in winemaking. You know, harvest is a really hard time for us. Where Greg is, you know, leaves before we wake up, comes back way after we're asleep, and we have a young kid at at home and I still have to work and I still have, you know, juggling a few jobs. And so how do you, I feel like, find your balance within the industry is something that I think we need to start thinking about it and talking about it a lot more um, yeah. as an industry and in our marriage. <laughs> Quick, get back to that too. So yeah. <laughs> You're doing a lot of sneak previewing, this is excellent. Uh, I'm curious about, uh, and this is, can be kind of a combo answer if you want, but we like to ask what people, what we want people, what you want people to take away from a bottle of your wine. I'm also curious in this case, what you want to take away from hospitality with, with, with a, from a tasting. So what would be the ultimate like compliment takeaway someone could have from tasting with you and, and from the actual wine itself? I think, I, you know, we are lucky to have, you know, people who have, don't know anything about wine, never tasted wine before, or know very little bit about wine all the way up to, you know, friends of ours who have been in the wine business for 20 years and know more than we do uh, about wines. And I think just the biggest thing to take away, the biggest thing that I enjoy personally, is just someone's enjoyment of it. You don't have to dissect the wine and say, I appreciate it because of this and this and this. It's just, you know, especially from the novice, it just, you know, how am I supposed to enjoy this? What am I supposed to get? So just get pleasure. I mean, that's what wine is. You're supposed to open it up with some friends and have a good time. If you don't talk about the wine, that's okay. You know, the wine is supposed to be sometimes, it's the setting, it's the background, that if you don't notice it, that's okay. If someone mentions it it's for a wonderful reason and talk about it, that's great, but it's supposed to inspire everything else. It's supposed to inspire the conversation that you're having. That's, to me, that is pure enjoyment of just seeing people having a good time and the wine being you know, a part of that. What I love for the wine, I know it's not my realm of things, but you know, I think it was the summer we were at Red Hills Kitchen at the Atticus Hotel, and there was a bunch of dead women sitting outside smoking a cigar and having a bottle of Abeja wine. And I'm like, what are you drinking? And they're like, who are you? And I'm like, you're in Walnut Valley and you're drinking right now a cab? Like, what is wrong with you? And they're like, <laughs> Well, do you have one? I'm like, we sure do. And it's like, is it on the list? I'm like, well, we have our Chardonnay on the list, but they're like, we don't want, want, we want red wine. I was like, okay, cool. Let me run. I ditch him in the middle of our day. We have a babysitter out of the house. I run back here, grab a bottle, run back to the hotel, put it on their table. And I'm like, this is what you gotta be drinking. And it was just super funny to see these, <laughs> these, these guys, you know, a little macho, and they're like, we're tasting all weekend. This is the best one we've had. Who are you? We've never heard about this stuff. And this is for me when I'm like, yes. Like, we are on under radar, but you know, our price points are super, I think, fair and affordable. If we can over deliver and we can compete with the, the wineries that have beautiful views, that have fancy tasting rooms, that have you know, a higher price point, but people can have the same wow feeling with our wine, then I think we're doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually a great moment. <laughs> no, he was really mad at me. <laughs> Initially. <laughs> it was not a good moment. But I'm, um, you know, hard-headed. Like, over too. But we still have relationships, you know, I still have their business cards and we, we email, like, want to invest, you need an investor. <laughs> Just buy a few cases, help us out. <laughs> um, so it's, it's fun like that. From the hospitality standpoint, I think just, if they come out and they've had a great time and it was a genuine experience, that's what matters, wherever we are. We, um, there was this couple, I think two weeks ago, and they emailed us and they're like, we were at Recipe and we had our peanuts by a glass and we had four glasses, we should have bought a bottle at this point, but can we come taste? And I'm like, 
I'm at work, I can't be here, but you know, here's Greg's cell phone, he's at the winery right now. And you probably don't get to just go do a barrel testing with a winemaker on the fly, but let's do it. And I was like, Greg, make sure to wash glasses. <laughs> and glasses. be prepared, <laughs> they're coming your way. And it's, you know, we have the luxury of being so small and be able to do things like that, where we can just host people on the fly and taste through barrels and have this really authentic experience. I hope that it's something that we can, as we grow, continue to offer to have that proximity to, I think, just the wine and mm -hmm. the experience. And that's what matters. Let's talk about that growth. So, what, where do you, where do you, where are you now? Where do you hope to be? What, what's coming in the next, the next five, ten years? I, I'm getting a great look over here. I, you have ideas for where this is going. I'm excited. What, 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 what's next? Where do you hope to be? You do too. Um, buy land. And by land, I mean not necessarily plant a vineyard. I think there's a lot of really good fruit in Oregon that's planted, and people that you know, dedicate a lot of time and energy to farming the best possible fruit. And I don't think it's something that we necessarily want to put all our time and energy in. We'd love to have a little bit. Um, Greg has dreams of raising snails. So we might be doing that. Yeah, I think the, the, the goal is, yeah, to, is very simply put, to buy land so that we have something that is our own, whether we can you know, make our wine there or bring people there, but a natural setting to kind of show people, because you know, Oregon now is the land of tourism. People are coming here from all over the world, not just in Oregon, but to taste Oregon wines. And I think for us it'd be amazing to show, like, this is our version <laughs> of Oregon. You know, we've got whether we have grapes or not, but there's the, the bounty of what we have to offer Oregon to have just a slice of that. And also it's, it's completely selfish. It's to have a slice of that for ourselves and to raise uh, our son in that environment. Mm -hmm. And also maybe to raise some snails. <laughs> That's a first. We've not heard anything about, anybody excited about raising snails before. <laughs> do, you have a, do you have a size in mind, a production size in mind? I don't know if we have a, a precise number. I mean, it's probably one of those, when we get there, we'll know. Um, you know, our lofty goals are to, to have a good life, to, to eat well, drink well, and travel on occasion. And beyond that, you know, I, I, I no, what, what, whatever, you know, I think the problem with the wine industry in, in kind of goals is recognizing that at 65, you don't go, all right, it's time to retire. It's a it's a lifestyle business, and so at 65, I'm still going to be just as excited about the next harvest. So the end, you know, what, what the what, whatever line it is that we, you know, okay, we've gotten there. I don't know if that exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's been a slow growth. You know, we went from about 500 to about now 800 cases, which is as much as we can, I think, stretch ourselves financially. It's just. It's a lot of money to go in the fruit every vintage. Um, so making smart decisions and, you know, treating it like a business, which is also a huge thing, and not just being a winemaker and, you know, being hospitality, but, you know, how to sell wine and how to grow. And Garrick has been helping us kind of with spreadsheets and seeing, you know, how many markets are we opening and how many different SKUs and kind of the boring stuff that we need to think about, but that's super important mm -hmm. for healthy growth. So we're going for, I think, slow but healthy growth mm -hmm. for now. Mm -hmm. But I never really see this being a thousands of cases project. I don't know about you. No. I think it's... It's fun to be able to do everything yeah. yourself mm -hmm. as opposed to sitting behind a desk and you know, dictating to people, well, this is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the getting dirty is fun. Mm -hmm. That suit that my father bought me upon graduation is still going to go unused. <laughs> Although I've already outgrown it, probably. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the industry more in general now. I, I know you talked earlier about diversity in the industry as an important cause to you. I know you were involved in the Assemblage Symposium recently. Uh, tell me about what changes you've seen in the industry, and it can be from that perspective or any other perspective, and, and kind of what Oregon wine looks like now in, in 2020. I say this to a lot of people, so 
I'm not saying this because you are here today. One of the most exciting things that I've seen was the Wine Studies program at Linfield. Um, and I'm super, I mean, I'm very, very, very um, a strong believer in that. I had the opportunity to go to a school back home in Montreal, ETHQ, Institut de Tourisme de du Québec, which is, um, you know, specializes with the exact same mentality of saying, okay, we're going to create programs that are very specific. It started with broader hospitality, but with time they've added the wine programs and things like that and allow you to travel and make those connections for you to go. And, you know, I've studied part of, of my studies in, in Barcelona and in Spain and, you know, in France. And you grow so much as an individual, as a person, especially in the industry that we're in, where I feel like it's almost silly not to go and discover what's out there, right? Um, hopefully, we're talking to you who's here today, but, you know, hopefully after you go and you travel and you experience the world, you come back to Oregon and you come back to a place that's home and you help us grow the industry. That's what we need. I want to see younger people being excited rather than discouraged by the industry. I think a lot of time, you know, it's a lot of work, ha work hard, <clears throat> hard, you know, income situations in the industry, but, you know, as we grow as an industry, we're treating things, even the moms and pops are, I think, doing a better job at treating it as a business and being mindful of how we're growing and how we can support our people in the industry is really important. Mm -hmm. So that's been super exciting to me to see, you know, let's invest in our people here to have the resources and the skills and the competence and the knowledge to to come in our industry. I came at a time where there was a lot of transplant. I was a transplant mm -hmm. five, six years ago. And a lot of people who came in the industry were also coming from California, from France. So if we get to have these people that grew up here, that know Oregon, that know the sites, <clears throat> that can have all those skills, mm -hmm. it's the best case scenario mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. <laughs> Cosine, 100%. <laughs> what else? Diversity, inclusion. Yeah, tell me about um, that. It's an industry that has a lot of old white male in it. Um, because I think of um, <clears throat> the traditions of, you know, generations. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of almost new, uh, old world, I'm sorry, rather than new world. Um, so that's a little different. <clears throat> but as we're growing, I'm really excited to see um, the programs that are at Chemekara, the Aivoy situations, where we are, once again, taking the people that we have here that know Oregon best and giving them the tools to to grow within our industry. Um, that is, I think, key to success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that taking what we actually have here, existing here, the people, the people instead of for a long time, it was people coming here to get into the wine business, but we have amazing people here, and now we've got amazing programs here, as you said. So it's more a matter of supporting that, bringing those people in, and also making sure that everyone, you know, from vineyard workers and everywhere else, that people are getting livable wages, that, you know, family supporting wages, health care, things like Salud, you know, people have done amazing jobs in trying to address those issues. Yeah, I think we're just entering a new phase where, um, you know, the landscape is, is changing and we need to keep up with it as an industry. That's really important. We need to have those discussions that are hard, that, you know, but we we talk about it so much in our insular circles. You know, how many times do I talk to other, you know, um, girls or co-workers in the industry that we have similar little positions and similar businesses and we talk about those situations of you know harassment or being bullied or being I see it all the time I go in accounts in Portland and people I'm the wife of the winemaker you know I get that all the time and it's like I know <laughs> I know this juice I have helped make it I've helped you know mm -hmm. think about it I've helped so much but you know there's still I don't know. What's the word? We have a ways to go still. Yes. Ex Dis dismissiveness, maybe? A I think bit? so. I think towards many different things in the industry. That's just my personal experience. Um, but I just want more openness. You know, 
for me, Portland, I moved here, and it's like, you have this vision of, you know, keep Portland weird. And it's very gritty, and it's very raw, and it's very open-minded. And then you get in here, you're like, ooh, okay. <laughs> yes, but like, why does that not translate to the wine industry? Why are we mar marginalizing, you know, some people that are trying to make different types of farming or different types of wine varietals or different um, bring different, I think, like notions or concepts to the wine industry. It's still very mm -hmm. square in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that newer generation um, that's coming through, I think, and kind of, I don't know if it's that they have less fears or that they're more comfortable with it, but you know, Tyler at Monument Wines, I think that you've interviewed, mm -hmm made his first vintage with you at Methven and like super inspiring to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I hope that we see more of these, I think, younger producers that are pushing the boundaries a little bit more. And for them, diversity inclusion, it's not necessarily something that they have to work. It's just part of mm -hmm. their culture and their generation and their environment. So that's, I think, going to be a little bit more Maybe, I don't know. We'll bring a bit more change. Good, my bad. What, what do you see as you look ahead for Oregon wine? What is it going to look like in, in 2030 from, from any perspective? Uh, is it going to grow? Is it going to consolidate? What do you see as you look ahead? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question, but <clears throat> I really don't know. I mean, at a certain point, you think, well, there's only so much land to grow. And then, you know, you, you hear about these huge plots of land that you know, they just put in 200 acres over there. Mm -hmm. All right, we still have plenty more to grow. I just think with every, you know, new vintage, with every, you know, next generation coming in, it's making us more uh, stronger as an industry. You know, I remember hearing stories, you know, in Oregon wine industry in the 80s, people had to kind of, you know, please listen to us, we're making wine in Oregon. You know, it's, it's we get a little bit more of, a, you know, the, the credibility mm -hmm. with every year. Um, so I think in 20, 30 years, hopefully, we'll be going to a weird place to sell our wine and people won't go, wait, where's Oregon? Instead, you know, they will know exactly where Oregon is. And that's happening, and that's happened because of all the people before us that have, you know, I remember when Maria Ponzi, she went to Germany to sell Oregon wine. It's like, that's pretty impressive to go to a, you know, a land that sells, that makes their own wine and tremendous wines mm -hmm. and to say, hey, you're going to buy Oregon wines. So I think, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but it's going to be because of the people that have worked their butts off before us and the people that we see now working their butts off. I know what I want to see. I want to see we're already very sustainable. I want to see more sustainability. Mm -hmm. I want to see you know the live certifications become a little stricter mm -hmm. with what's allowed um, as far as praise, for example. I want to see more of you know the Mimi Castiles of this world working on regenerative agriculture. Hard for me in English. Um, I want to see more people doing esoteric projects, but that really are all about farming. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is Oregon after all. We are West Coast, we are hippie, we are all about farming. So can we see more of that in, in wine? And I'm talking, you know, I'm always thinking about like Nate, at Hayu in the Gorge, mm -hmm. doing things that are, seem so out there, but at the same time are very Oregon, Oregonian in, in their ways. Um, is that something that we're gonna do? No, but that's what I want to see more of, mm -hmm. right? It's more diversity in, in the fruit um, and a healthier culture, I think, mm -hmm. is up there. In having the next generation come in is at the top of, of everything. Mm -hmm. um, we've learned, you know, it was built, our industry was built on uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. and, and by diversity, I mean like kind of that like, community, right? It's like people came from different places, but they were all worked together so well mm -hmm. to build an industry that we're in. Now we've have, you know, 50 plus years in a Willamette Valley under our belt. Um, 
we're I think doing amazing things. We have, um, you know, the Oregon Wine Board, and we have Walnut Valley Wine Growers Association, and so many fantastic I think strength behind the industry, pushing us forward into the world. Into you know they were just in South Korea doing a tasting, mm -hmm. and you know they're all over promoting Oregon wine and doing amazing things. And so I think that. Um, the wave is there, it's out there, it's happening. But now let's take a little bit of a step back and look ahead of us and mm -hmm. see what can we change to make it a better industry. To retain its people, I see so many people all the time. You know, at Roy, I've poached a handful of Linfield students. Um, but a lot of them leave the industry just because they want something that is, whether it's, you know, 401ks or, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. things that we don't necessarily can offer as a small or medium-sized wineries. Um, so I just want us to think about that. Mm -hmm. Business business sustainability as well, mm -hmm. yeah. clearly. Right? Very much so. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. It's easy for me to say, you know, I come from a place where there is universal health care <laughs> and your long maternity leaves. And, you know, it's a very a different landscape So from what I grew up with and I know. So I understand, and it's, it's something to readjust to the reality of where we are now, but there's room for change and improvement. So you two have talked about this a little bit throughout the interview, and I'm just sort of curious to get your, both your thoughts here as we kind of close this out. You, the, the balance for you as, as, a, as a married couple who, is also, who are also business partners, uh, how do you balance work and life? How do you, uh, what's the secret to, to success in both uh, personal and business when you are, when they are so intertwined? Yeah, I don't know what the secret is. Um, I don't, it's, the easy answer is it's, it's tough. Um, it can be exhausting because it's you know, your partner in every way. You know, you don't get to wake up and avoid that conversation. Um, you know, it's you have to kind of face everything, uh, whether you want to or not. It's uh, that's that's the negative side of it. But the the positive side of it is, you know, when you can make it through all of those hard uh, junctures. It makes you better as uh, you know, a family, as a partner, and as a business. So yeah, I don't. I mean, we're lucky in that we have very much aligned values. So you know, when we go on vacation, we're not necessarily going to a wine region for vacation, but we're both both very excited to go taste wines of that area to eat and drink and you know have a wonderful time. Our you know goal in life is to as we talked about have a little bit of land. So mm -hmm. it's it's really the secret, I guess, maybe I do know the secret, is just being with someone who, you know, doesn't, you don't have to have the same values and the same goals, but similar to the point where, you know, when you end up wherever you end up, that it's a, it's a happy place. Mm -hmm. huh. We struggle with it every day. Oh yeah. We've, you know, I've tried to do things where we have like a weekly meeting and it's like Tuesday mornings we meet and it's a Suzor meeting, but, Greg is dreadfully trying to avoid them because <laughs> I'm very business. When we meet, I'm like, oh, blah, blah, blah. like I drill down to my list and I put my, you know, like it's business mm -hmm. hat on. I'm not. He's like, well, you don't smile in those meetings. I'm like, I'm not there to smile. I'm there to like get stuff done. And so we are very different in that sense. Where I can also think about and talk about the business 24/7. I'm constantly, you know. I saw something that inspired me, and it's, oh, let's go get a weekend, and we could go taste there. And you know, if it's not a winemaking region, we're in the south of France. It's like, well, it's you know the the make of perfume, and it's like, well, let's go talk to this really you know small independent guy that's kind of like us, but that does these amazing perfumes, and how we can learn and translate you know these aromas to wine. And I'm just like, go go. And sometimes Greg is just like, Whoa. I need you to like slow down and he wants to spend the afternoon gardening in the backyard um, where I'm like okay what's the next plan and what's the next hospitality program and the event we're gonna do and where are we gonna do it and who are we gonna do a collaboration with and so I think it's finding that balance where he kind of like calms me and grounds me I push him a little bit out of his comfort zone and we just try to 
I think just learn to communicate and listen mm -hmm. and respect each other is at the base of everything else. And then have fun with it. Mm -hmm. I think number one. If not, what's the point? At the end of the day, we're making wine, so we get to relax at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> it's, less of wine. And we often say that. I, well, like, we get super stressed and like we into our heads, and I'm like, whoa. We make fermented grape juice for a living. Like, let's just all <laughs> chill. And like, that's my own almost like personal, like, it brings me down, you know, we're not saving lives. We're not, we need to have fun with this. We need to stay inspired, stay motivated to better ourselves and make the best wine that we can possibly make with what we have and put it out there in the world. Um, but yeah, we're only doing this to share, you know, a good meal with, people, sometimes friends, sometimes family, sometimes people that we know nothing about. It's really awkward, but hopefully by the end of the meal, <laughs> it gets better. You know, all those winemaker dinners where you're sat, you're thrown in a big table with a bunch of strangers and sometimes. That's what the wine's for. Exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> interesting, <laughs> but could be a lot worse. Yeah. Excuse me. So all the questions that I have for you two today. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? I didn't think. Got open, oh, thank open you so much for thank you so continuing much. to do what yeah. you guys are doing. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful it's super to, cool. to see the archives growing and to hear you know, stories from so many different people. It's impressive. Thank you for us too, obviously. We very much enjoy this, as you can tell. So thank you it's both for fun. sitting with us and thank for sharing so your honesty and your stories today. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook.